On today's episode, I sit down with Mac Lackey. Mac firstly has built and sold six companies. He is an angel investor in more than 75, has sat on the buy side on a multi-billion dollar business acquiring businesses. So Mac's insights deeply seat with inside of what it is to go through that process of buying and selling businesses. And we have a great session. I learned a tremendous amount as to what you should look at when you're looking to exit. I don't have enough good things to say about the man himself. And I think that the session too adds a lot of value to me in life and moving forward. These are all the things that I'm going to consider when I look to step into any businesses that I hope to step into in future. I hope you get the value out of it. I did. Hi. And welcome to Successful Scales, the show where I interview now successful professionals about their journey and try and garner insights onto any tips that can be applied to your business at home. Whether it's financial freedom or the exit of your company, wherever your journey may take you, the idea here is to simply learn from those who have done it before. I hope you enjoy and you get some value out of this. Buckle up and enjoy the episode. I'm honored to have you on an episode of Successful Scales. Thanks for making time in your schedule. Um, you know, I've had the good fortune of sitting down with you a couple of times in the last few weeks. So uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited about uh, spending some time chatting. Well, um, likewise, I, I honestly, it's, it's such a valuable resource to everyone listening, but also in particular for me to be able to ask you a lot of the questions that I have in my mind and, um, and, and just how you approach, you know, I was very fortunate to be part of your exit DNA course. But before, before we dive into all of that, um, for those who don't know who you are, love you to give, you know, someone gave me the terminology, sort of the back of the baseball card readout of, uh, of who you are. So I'd love, uh, I'd love you to share that if you will. I like that. I haven't heard that one, the back of the baseball card. So yeah, my sort of the short version, my highlight reel, if you will, the back of the baseball card, I would say was I, you know, started scaled up and exited six companies over the last 25 years. Um, that would be omitting the fact that I made a million mistakes and did a lot of things wrong, but, but that's sort of the, the highlight reel. So I think of myself as kind of a career entrepreneur, super passionate about starting and scaling companies. And looking back now over 25 years, one of the big differentiators for, for me was six exits. You know, at the time I was not building businesses to sell. I was just, you know, scaling companies, doing what I love to do. But now that I'm sort of looking backwards, I see that that's, you know, one of the big differentiators and kind of a theme that I am starting to pursue in, in the second half of my uh, entrepreneurial career. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I, I love how you casually throw it in there. But the reality is you're one of the most humble, genuine people I've come in contact with, you know, period. It's, you know, like when you when I sat in the exit DNA uh, course and you talk about, you know, when you were on the buy side of a, you know, a multi-billion dollar uh, publicly traded company and the number of companies you're an angel investor in. And also, I mean, for, for those listening as well, like I'd love you um to give a plug effectively around exit DNA. I'm personally two weeks into it and the immense value that I'm getting out of it from just from a, a framework and a consideration, um, it, you know what? Um, it's life-changing. So love to, love to hear, uh, or for those listening, love them to sort of understand, you know, you are moving into this second half of your entrepreneurial career and without putting words in your mouth, you strike me as a guy who really is about helping others, you know, maximize their potential, investing in entrepreneurs and looking to, to take them to the next level. So, I mean, I just think everyone needs to hear about what exit DNA is. So just briefly. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate your kind words. I mean, the, the reality is after my sixth exit, which was October of 2018, shortly after that, I was asked to, go to an event and speak. And up to that point, you know, I did not consider myself a good speaker. I generally opted out of events um, as a, an attendee or certainly as a speaker. Um, but I, I went to this event and there were probably 150 or so entrepreneurs in the audience. 
and they asked me to speak about exits. And at that point, because I wasn't speaking on stage, I, I basically stood up and told stories and things I had done well, things I, you know, mistakes I'd made and just kind of took people through that journey. And as I walked off the stage, seven or eight people came kind of jogging up to me and said, Mac, I, I need your help. And at the time, I didn't really understand, but now, again, with the benefit of hindsight, I see that one of the big things that resonated with them was that of my six personal exits, I never sold based on a financial metric. And so I had never sold an EBITDA multiple or revenue multiple. And so many of these entrepreneurs consider that a breath of fresh air. Like my business might be worth more than five times EBITDA. And I was like, 100%. You should never sell based on those kind of simple metrics. And so at that point, I realized, wow, I have a unique set of experience in my background. And so as really a test, I created a, a platform or a program called Exit DNA, which was really to give founders and leaders of companies the frameworks that they need to optimize exit value and as much as anything, create the option, because one of the most powerful things from my point of view is if you're a founder or a leader of a great entrepreneurial venture, you don't want to be forced to sell it. You want the option and you want to, you know, you want the option to sell it on your time frame, your terms, and ideally at maximum value. And candidly, I've been very fortunate to have had six exits because my first two um, although they were great, they were life-changing in so many ways, but I look back and know that I left millions on the table. And I think to myself, what if that was it? What if that was just, you know, I only had one exit, which is what most founders will have, or maybe two. And knowing that I can help people ensure that they don't look back and realize all the simple things they could have done, I just decided I really need to pursue this. So as you said, I'm I'm kind of at this point where I'm mostly trying to help. I'm, I'm speaking as much as I can. I offer this program, which is, um, I hear other people's words are, you know, it pays for itself in a month. You're not charging enough money, um, which makes me very happy because I feel like I'm adding value. And um, at this point, you know, people are sort of joining Exit DNA, mostly through referrals, um, which means I, you know, I think I'm doing something right. So, so yeah, that's kind of the program. I mean, you know, there just a tribute to how humble you are. Um, I, I will be one of those people who will say that it absolutely pays for itself. And it's the, I also, I just love the format. I love that you have the do it yourself course, the reiteration of the weekly sessions, the community that's built, the caliber of personnel. Like for me, as you know, as an entrepreneur, and I seldom use that word, but I probably should just start feeling a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, I feel like, you know, I'm fortunate now to be inside of a space in a community where I get to talk and speak to very high level people. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of pushed and I'm challenged and I'm thinking about the world differently. And it's not even, I, I didn't even walk into this course thinking, okay, I want to exit. I'm trying to sell this business, package it up. Can I go through any of these? Uh, objectives. I just, for me, I'm on that sort of, you know, unquenchable thirst for knowledge and, you know, stepping into this, it's just been so illuminating. And I'm in week two, it's an eight week course. It goes on for effectively an entire year. I mean, the value is ridiculous in terms of who you get access to. You get access to Mac right here. I mean, you guys don't realize how privileged you are listening to him today. <laughs> but, oh, you're being way, way too kind. <laughs> um, but 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 in all honesty, um, you know, it, it, it's great. I get no referral bonuses, just so you guys know. Um, but you touched on a few things there, and and I want to dig into them because you said that um, you know you've had six exits. I mean, that in itself is you know, is like you said, maybe you have one or two exits, six exits is not something you come across um, every day or every week or even every month in terms of people that you get to, to talk to. And so, you know, you're obviously when you're assessing businesses and, you know, fortunately I've had, you know, the opportunity to hear a little bit about the different, the diversity effectively of the businesses that you've created and sold what are some of the things that attract you to a business that you're going to uh, grow, scale, sell? You know, what were, what were some of those driving factors that, um, 
you know, with attributing things that said, yeah, this is something that I want to sink my teeth into. Yeah, I think my own journey is probably similar to a lot of entrepreneurs. If I look back across the companies that I put most of my time and energy into, they were either a problem I was trying to solve, something I, I sort of identified that there was a, a need and I was you know, convinced that I could assemble a team of people and, and put the right resources behind solving that problem. Um, so that's a, that was a big driver for me. The other thing, which I still think is really top of mind for me all the time is, is I really think about, there's that famous Wayne Gretzky quote about skiing or uh, skating where the puck is going. And I think a lot about where, where the markets are headed, where opportunities are in the future. And I just try to get ahead of big trends. And so, you know, I, the, the, I consider it almost luck, but my first business, you know, I started in the first quarter of 1995, shortly after Netscape launched the commercial web browser, I started an internet company. And so, you know, and, and I had a long series of being ahead of pretty significant trends and that has served me incredibly well. And so, you know, I, I think the combination of solving problems that I felt like, you know, needed to be solved and just thinking about the timing of major shifts and trends in the market have been probably the two biggest drivers of, you know, why I decide to do something. And then the, the last like overlay, you know, several of my companies, I think really three of, of my six um, also hold together an area of personal interest. You know, I'm a big soccer uh, guy. So, you know, international football and several of my companies were, you know, they might've been a tech business or a media business, but we started with soccer as an area of focus because I was very comfortable and knowledgeable and passionate about that particular area. So those are kind of the, the big, I guess, drivers of my businesses. Yeah. And I think if you can tie your passion to, you know, what is your business, then it doesn't feel like work, you know, at all. So it makes a whole, whole lot of sense. So you go through it six times, right? And you've invested in a lot of other companies. You've been on the buy side, you, you know, you, you, you've got access to effectively like massive amounts of data. Um, you know, if you sort of break it down, do you come at every situation or every new business with the same sort of formulaic approach? Like, are you looking to first hire the right people and then build the processes? Or are you looking at it like, you know, here's the future trend. I see the vision around it. I'm going to pull in, like, is there, is there anything that you would say is sort of formulaic about how you approach the entry into a market and therefore the growth and scale of a business? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. I would say, um, now that I'm thinking more for my exit DNA program, I'm trying to think about things from a more systems and process driven approach, which I know, you know, you're a, you're a world-class expert at, at those concepts. But for me, I was doing things that, you know, it was almost like, Hey, it's common sense or it's intuitive to me, or it's a gut feeling. You know, when I was an entrepreneur self described, those were the words I was using. But in hindsight, looking back at the trends and the themes, I can see patterns, which are really the frameworks that I use now. So, you know, for example, I mean, one overarching theme is always, it is always about the people. And so people, to me, um, a theme has been, I try to assemble people around my business that can move the needle in very significant ways but because I've had a lot of early stage, high growth kind of companies without a lot of resources, the way I would bring the people into the business was a key part of it. Meaning I would form a very intentional board of advisors with very specific sets of expertise that could help me you know, create the leverage I needed in, in my business. I could have never hired those people. I could have never afforded to pay them, but bringing them on as, advisors who were aligned around my success gave me a huge you know amount of leverage in, in scaling my companies and so things like that which i consider now they're formulaic like if the second i start thinking about an idea very seriously 
you know, I create a document with my aspirational board of advisors and I just start, you know, who are these people? Um, so things like that have become a lot more formulaic now that I have the benefit of, you know, hindsight. Which is always uh, valuable in 2020, isn't it? Um, so so uh, you touched on so many great points and things that I think, uh, you know, the way I sort of look at successful scales is typically if things are going to be relevant to me, I imagine that my audience are probably going through, you know, variants of the same questions. And so um, you touched on the fact that, um, uh, you know, you've grown six companies, sold them. Is there a particular size that you, you know, do you like that fundamental creation from nothing to growing to a particular size? Like, is there something that has been a theme throughout for you or? Yeah. Yeah. Again, the, the, the hindsight is, is really interesting because, you know, early on in my career, you know, I started my first business in my, my twenties and um, because we were very early in that kind of internet 1.0, web 1.0 space. Um, it was self-funded effectively. We grew it as a very traditional garage startup, um, but it grew very fast. And we got an opportunity three years later, you know, for an eight figure exit when I, you know, basically not that long before was eating, you know, eating ramen noodles, hoping to like make my rent. And so, the light bulb went off at that point. It was like, wow, if I really lean hard into these businesses and create value, I can generate a lot of, um, you know, enterprise value or strategic value pretty quickly. But it wasn't really until my third company, ironically, um, one of the board members of my third business, so I'd already had two exits in my 20s, um, had, had been sort of successful by most measures. But I was running my third company and I got into a little bit of a disagreement with the board about growth. And it was really because I wanted to be aggressive. You know, it was a it was kind of in the, the midst of the post uh, 2000 NASDAQ crash. The technology was kind of in a dip. And I wanted to use that as an opportunity to buy stuff and be really aggressive. And some of my partners were like, you know, we're making great money. Why would we put everything at risk? And one of the board members came in and said, Mac, you know, this is a, a decision you need to make. You can, if you're a startup guy, you will probably choose to leave the business and start your next thing. If you want to be a CEO, you stay here through this downturn, you build the operations, you build the team, you just, you know, kind of stick in. And I resigned the next day. I realized like I'm a startup guy. Like I don't want to be sitting still building something I want to be scaling and growing. So that was a really key insight for me, which is I don't think I am interested or even really capable of operationalizing a business at a certain scale. You know, once it's kind of created a market, generated value, is starting to really show promise and scale, I tend to start to think, this is probably better in someone else's hands who really wants to do the operational work, who really wants to invest the time and energy into, you know, turning this into a much bigger enterprise. And I'm already thinking about the next thing. And so I had a blog years ago. I used to, it was called being serial and parallel because another friend said, you know, you're not a serial entrepreneur. You're, you're parallel. You're running multiple at a time. But a lot of that was my, love for and interest in that that earliest phase and once it started proving itself out i would start to lose interest and so i've had a bias towards selling early you know my, all my exits have been you know seven and eight figures some of those companies have gone on and you know are nine figure businesses or they've turned into a part of a much larger company but i sold them well before that point because that's kind of where my interest stopped um, only other comment I would make, which I think is really relevant is, you know, I learned in, in 2000, in March of 2000, I had a term sheet from a very sophisticated venture capital firm in New York to invest $15 million in, in my second business. And it was right at the time NASDAQ, you know, crashed and the stock market, um, the dot-com bubble burst. And what's interesting about it is, 
if we would have in fact taken that term sheet, the math was really simple. We would have had to grow the company over a hundred million dollars for me to get the exact same return that I got because I just decided to sell the company right then. I sold the company for $15 million instead of raising capital and my partners and I split the money. But in order to get that same amount of money, I would have had to raise 15 million, grow it to a hundred, hope everything worked out. And so sometimes you do the math and you say, you know what, if I can sell now for 5 million or 10 million or 15 or 20, whatever the numbers are, it might be as significant as what you would get in the future with all that additional risk after you're diluted by growth and capital and all those things. So it's a, it's a real key point where you have to decide, is it worth the risk to kind of go to the next level? And, uh, you know, and I think that that's a challenge that most people face, you know, I mean, I, you know, from someone dealing with going from, you know, a team of four of us and now we're like at 140, I think today is the count. And, it's a different world that I'm living in right now. And, you know, I still have the the passion and the hunger and, you know, where, where are continuing to evolve, but it's really interesting to sit here, you know, with someone who has the good fortune of having that level of hindsight is, you know, what are we trying to achieve here? What, what is the thing that is going to get you out of bed day in, day out to, to go forward and what's doubling down and over indexing on that investment and then having it potentially blow up in your face. And so that's sort of the, the risk reward that you're constantly um, juggling. So my question to you though stems from the, the, the fact that like, when I look at, you know, my very, very young career in, as being an entrepreneur and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still, um, you know, you're very young for how successful you've been in terms of the number of exits and what you've been able to achieve. Um, but the, the question I have is, the startup that I've gone through, you know, the last 18 months across two businesses and getting to this point, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm doing a lot of the things that I didn't start a business to do. I didn't start a business to work 70 hour, 80 hour weeks, 45, 50 hour, you know, like that nonstop constant grind of like, okay, we've got to prove this out. We've got to prove this out. Like we've hit a point of profitability right now. I'm still never going to take my foot off the gas. We're starting to be able to put the right people in the right places. We can now afford more expensive leadership and better talent. And, you know, these are the sort of the tools that we're adding to our arsenal, but does that starting point for you, you know, are you coming at it from a point of, you love that grind in that startup? Are you building the businesses better? Are you coming in, you know, with funding? What, what's sort of your, what is your, your net zero, your starting point? Yeah. Yeah, so, so one area, and I don't know if you've ever heard this story um, or not, but it's, it's super um, important to me on every level, you know, personally, and, and it has been a defining factor in, in an area where I'm also very different than so many people you would talk to that might have built a number of companies. And that is, so after my second business, I sold it in July of 2000, and in August of 2000, my first daughter was um, to be born. And I basically went into um, effectively depression because up until that point, up until July of 2000, my life was very much defined by work. I was sleeping on the floor in the office, working 70, 80, 90 hours a week. I was married, you know, young, young, new couple. And my wife, you know, was understanding, but it was, I was burning it, you know, hard. And um, the reason I was depressed is because I, I really thought of that as the formula. I work hard, I grind, I get things going, and then I sell them. That was kind of my mindset. But I was thinking, how do I do that when I really want to be a good father? You know, I want to be, I've got this baby girl getting ready to be born and I, I can't sleep on the floor and then have dinner with my daughter. So very long story short, I made a decision in August of 2000 that I was effectively not going to accept the trade-offs. I promised kind of myself and my wife and my newly born daughter, who obviously didn't understand yet what I was saying, uh, that I was going to be home for dinner every night and I was going to coach her soccer teams and I was going to carve the pumpkins in her class, which I had no idea how I was going to do that. But that decision to not accept that trade-off that it had to be one or the other. You could either be a startup entrepreneur 
or a very engaged father, you couldn't do both because they would run counter to one another. Um, the, the way I tell the story, especially if I'm speaking now, is like, you know, in the uh, fall of 2019, I dropped that little girl off for her freshman year of college at NYU. And over that four year period, I built and sold four more companies and I never missed a moment. I mean, I was there every night for dinner. I was, I coached her teams. I did everything. I traveled the world with her. Um, and what's so powerful about that is it is because I made that decision that I got smarter. I basically taught my teams um, that Mac is going to leave at five o'clock every day. It doesn't matter what crisis is going on. It doesn't matter if we're in the middle of a meeting. I would literally stand up and walk out of the office because I was going home for dinner. And so what's crazy is I found out very quickly my teams got better as a result of that. Like knowing that Mac is going to leave or he may not show up tomorrow because his daughter has a dance, you know, recital or something literally forced the level of execution and the processes and everything that made our businesses work just got better. So now, um, as a matter of fact, my very last company, I didn't even, I was the largest shareholder. I was, you know, all, I had all of the, the, the expectations would have been Mac is just running this thing. The team honestly didn't even, and they, they, every meeting had to happen without me. And then if I showed, but, but I did the business a lot better. So very long winded answer, but yeah, it's something I actually feel really, really strongly about is founders get in their own way. We create our own bottlenecks to scale. We create our own challenges because we put ourselves in the critical path. And when we're grinding like that, people don't, Rise to the occasion. Systems are not required because everybody knows they can do it. They'll be there working. So the minute you you still have the expectation, the business has to grow and it has to perform. It has to do the same things whether you're there or not. The business gets better. So that's kind of how I I learned it through that process. And and that uh, makes a lot of sense. And for you know for the not longest time uh, I've known you, I have seen you go on trips and I've understood that you've made a very intentional decision around the direction of how you want to live your life every day. And, you know, being very early into the course, you know, your, your um, great outcome and how you look to define your life, you know, it's, it's that level of intention as to how do I want to live my life and work backwards to creating that is paramount and so i think when you build in that time scarcity that mac is going to leave at 5 p.m on the dot doesn't matter rain hail or shine what's happening in the business you know you you start to i'm, I'm guessing you, you start to become more resourceful and you, you you leverage the leverage that you create in the personnel that you bring in and yeah i mean it's uh it makes a, a whole lot of sense to me right now and you know i'm someone who's trying to make better decisions not to fall into this, you know, effectively this same cycle that I think a lot of entrepreneurs go through, you know, they, they simply think that the solution is to work harder and to, to put in more hours. And if you just get through this next month and this next two months and you fix this one thing, but if you're not intentional about how you approach any situation in life and in business, then, you know, uh, hindsight will always be 2020 but you can't change the past so make those decisions early on and move through yeah, that. I, no it's exactly right and i think it's so hard because right now at this particular moment in time you know you have a lot of and i always pick on gary vanderchuk I, I i don't know gary i have respect for him in plenty of ways but you know he's kind of shouting from the rooftops that you have to put in the time you have to grind and you know, put everything on hold now. And once you're successful, then you can go do those things. And I just fundamentally disagree. Um, I just think that is, is a counterbalance to scale. It's like, it's, it's negative to scale. It's negative to freedom. So, I mean, today, I mean, this, I literally live my life. I think some people think I'm just you know, saying it, but I mean, today is like every day for me, you know, I got up and worked out. I came in, I did the exit DNA session a little while ago. I literally stopped the session. I went and had lunch with my wife and we went on a walk together. I came back and we'll do this. 
the second this is over, I have my Champions League game that I'm going to go watch in the back porch with my dogs. I mean, like I design my day around what gives me energy and joy. And then I'm still not saying I'm not going to work hard. I may work late tonight. I may work over the weekend. I design every part of my life around what gives me energy. And I expect my companies and investments to work within that framework. And as a result of that, they just get better. You know, it's not like I'm, I'm penalizing them. I'm allowing them to get better without me as a burden. It's, it's just, you know, it's counterintuitive for some people. To me, it is the formula. So, well, firstly, I, cannot tell you how much i love the fact that you just called out gary v because <laughs> i i i do not believe in you know in that at all i i cannot stress enough that that whole gary v mindset of the always on hustle work 27 hours a day like it is it's it's not possible and it's it, it, it's not scalable and so i think when i look at the way you approach designing your life, you know, I think even in itself as a, as a role model and an example to the people that work inside of the businesses, you set the tone. And so you say, right, I'm going to design my life. I'm going to live my best life. And the expectation is for you to deliver on what your accountability and your responsibility is in the business. But you've got authority and autonomy and the opportunity to design your life better as well. So as a result, you know, they talk about um, companies having effectively the personality of the CEO. And when you're building a company that is wired that way, it's inevitable that the DNA will flow through it in, in that way. So I think actually, while you might, you know, on the outside, someone might be looking and saying, well, you know, Max designing his life and he's living this great life. But what you're really doing is you're empowering all of your team members to make the same great decisions that they should be making for their life in business. Exactly right. Yeah, I do. I do think it's probably because of the media and things that were were told and the expectations that are set. People think that that's a selfish kind of approach in some cases. And you know, you have this, you know, I need to be grinding harder than anyone, but that really does it does not give your team permission to optimize for their life and their highest level of productivity. Some people are night people. Some people are morning people. You're, when you create rigid frameworks around your business, you're really not empowering anybody to kind of rise to the occasion. And I think good people rise. And so you give them freedom, you empower them, you allow them to do what they do well, they just get better and better. But the minute you start putting constraints around them because of your own personality or your own frameworks, they're just not going to do as good of a job. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in that philosophy, and you know, I, I I almost like to look at my team members in in the business as giving them, you know, I sat down with our recruitment team today, and I said to them, listen, guys, like, forget the KPIs that are set around how many placements we make a month. I don't I actually couldn't care less if we hit that number, we don't hit that number. All I'm looking for, you guys could define whatever your KPI, whatever you guys think is a reasonable KPI, build your own KPIs. All we're looking to do is really understand what's the problem we're trying to solve here and is it attainable, isn't it? And you guys build the solution. You're all super smart people. You know, you've been brought into this business for a reason. Figure it out. And if I can be of help, I'm here. I'll put my hand up. I'll get in the sessions. I love it. I like to problem solve and, you know, and troubleshoot what's going on. But, you know, that's the whole point, right? Is you bring in great people who are self-motivated and are wanting to drive their own personal growth and development. So putting in the extra time or looking to design their life in a way that resonates or reflects that of yours, Mac, you know, that to them should in, in a way be inspiring and in a way for them to, to level up and to have that aspiration of, well, I can, I can do this. I can be a part of a business that's going to go from, you know, startup to sale. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yep. So it's powerful. I it's, it's, it's really powerful stuff. And, you know, and I, and I think as I continue to have conversations like this, a lot of the same themes and a lot of the same insights, you know, in different ways sort of present themselves. And, you know, there is effectively this framework of designing your life to live it today, not to kill yourself for the next 10 years to then, you know, be in my forties, for example, and say, right, 
now I can now I can take that trip that I've waited 40 years or, you know, my unborn children, I'll, I'll, I'll get to them when they're at that age or whatever it is, you know? I'll, so yeah, it, it's really, it really resonates with me. And, you know, I just adopted a dog in the last six months and I make a point to walk her two hours in the morning. Um, for me, it's oh, yeah. like such enjoyable time walking. I live on the beach. I walk along the beach with her and, you know, it's blocked off in my calendar, walking dusty. Like that's yeah. it, you know? Perfect. Don't bother me. Um, but I, I wrote that I wrote down a few more questions for you or a few things that were really interesting to me. Um, when you approach um, all the businesses that you've created historically, have you gone the solopreneur route? Have you had co-founders? Has that been something central to your decision making? Sort of how do you approach that um, that equation? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So I would say uh, a disproportionate number of my businesses, I've had co-founders. Um, I've had one longtime business partner uh, who is who's been, you know, a, a, a friend, a, a partner. You know, he's been a, a really trusted part of the journey. And the reason that in particular has been so valuable is it it is the um, having the unique abilities between the two of us where I can do what I do really well. He can do what he does well. They're very different things. And so they truly are collaborative or synergistic or whatever the term you want to use. Um, I think, you know, partnerships are, are really challenging. And I was fortunate to have found someone that was complimentary from a skill set perspective but, but more important than anything is like I, I trusted him and we had a very trusted partnership and you know mutual respect all those kind of things so I was very fortunate in that way I, I you know one of the worst things that ever happened in my entrepreneurial journey is I had a, a bad partnership and you hear these stories anytime you talk to someone that's been in partnerships certainly over time you will hear of problematic or failed or, you know, nightmarish partnerships. So, you know, what I have done, I think reasonably well, again, I got very fortunate. My, my longtime partner, Ross was just, you know, was and is unique, but um, I am not a, I'm not really a solopreneur. I like to come up with ideas. I like to really get excited about them. I, I like to work through them in my mind. And then I like to assemble a team that, can help me execute. And in many cases, those people are coming in so early, they may not be, you know, equal partners, but they are part of the founding team or very early. And so they're true, you know, partners in my success. Um, so that's, that's been very typical for me. I'm the kind of the first one to go. And several times because of the timing of our businesses, you know, we, I've sold a company, I'm working on my next idea. My partners are still with the business that acquired my last company. I've already resigned and working on the next idea. Six months later, I'm pulling them over with me and it's, you know, some of the same people and picking off a few new people. And so I, I'm a big believer in just people being a, a critical success factor. And so, yeah, most of my companies have had pretty significant partnerships or co-founders associated with them. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. It also just validates a lot of the things that I, I'm constantly thinking about. Like, how do I keep attracting the best talent to, to work with, to push forward, to have more stimulating conversations and to just really solve bigger and bigger problems. And, you know, it, it sounds to me like through your journey, you've been able to identify Ross and other key players that have had impact and you know recycle would be the wrong word here but you 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 effectively engage the same people and build you know that there's that level of cohesion like you know i know you know my co-founder lippy and you haven't met um our ceo joan but three of us have worked together now for three years across effectively three businesses realistically and you know there's a level of fluidity between us now where we just understand what role we play how we interact there's a level of trust and and integrity and you know i'm just sitting here uh proactively uh trying to get more and more of the right people um one of which you know well and actually introduced us who i'm obsessed with and there's no way that we don't work together in the future but um but uh i have another question for you before i get to uh 
too far into uh, how much I love uh, our mutual friend and the person that introduced us is you talked a little bit about before um, having a board of directors. And um, that really piqued my interest because, you know, for different businesses at different sizes and different disciplines. And, you know, I get to work with a lot of e-commerce entrepreneurs and businesses that are growing rapidly. You know, at what point should someone be, who should be considering firstly, uh, having a board of directors or advisors? Um, What's the approach? How does that mechanic work? Like I have just absolutely, I'm totally lay when it comes to, to that notion. You know, in my head, it's like, right, I'm a publicly listed company. I need a board of directors and, you know, there's the chairman and there's, you know, walk me through it. Sure. Well, first I'll respond to our mutual friend. You're going to have to fight me over her. So, (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry. Don't worry, Mac. You're involved in everything we're doing moving forward. Okay, perfect. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, just kidding. Yeah, no, it is it is funny how over time, you know, the number of people that you you will meet great people. And because they're so important, you know, when you find someone you think is uniquely talented, you just really do want to pull them into your your sphere, you know, and, and kind of continue to work with them. So um, but yeah, so it's actually a really important distinction. The the board of advisors, so Board of advisors and board of directors means two very different things, and it's an important distinction. A board of directors, um, at least in the United States, for most general purposes, has a legal definition that is different. And that is basically those individuals have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. And generally speaking, um, I don't want to be on people's board of directors I don't, because I don't want to take liability for their business. I don't want to be, you know, in that position. So being a fiduciary, um, it is typically, you know, I've been on boards of public companies. um, I've been on boards of private companies, but what I like is board of advisors. And that key distinction allows you to pick individuals that are quite simply, uh, humans that you think will help you achieve your goals. And what you're looking for is you're looking for alignment between what you have, you identify, let's say you've got five critical success factors that you and Lippy go off site, you come up with these five big things that you're going to need to do to take your business to the next level. In a perfect world, each one of those critical success factors would have a board of advisors who is a member who is a world-class expert at that thing. And so, for example, one of my old companies, which was sports tech related, we thought, you know, we're going to have to master streaming. We're going to have to master mobile. We're going to have to master distribution and translation. So I had these kind of ideas that I thought were really, really critical for us building a, a scale business. And in that consideration, I wanted a world-class expert as an advisor for each category. So I had an individual who was a, you know, kind of a global superstar in the streaming world and someone else who was tons of mobile expertise. And the other key part of this is it is a, um, it is about alignment, meaning there are people that either want to help you or you've come up with something that will help them, which is incentive for them to help you. So it could be they get stock in your business It could be that, you know, you're advising them on scale and they're advising you on something that's their area of expertise. So as long as you find that alignment where it's mutually beneficial and you have a clear expectation about what their role is and what you're asking them for, that becomes a really, really valuable tool to help you build your business. Um, So I'm a, I've written several blog posts on my, my site about forming boards of advisors and how you should think about it. Cause I think it's just a, an untapped opportunity for so many entrepreneurs and founders is just create that amazing board of advisors that sort of surround your business. Yeah. And, and, and so when you go into businesses that you're creating, will you, will you bring them in as part of that? Let's call it like the incubation period where you're actually coming up with the concept and will you sort of say, right, well, 
we're looking to get into, you know, we're looking to get into the sports tech space. I'm going to actually straight away identify these people, sort of pitch them the, the concept and the idea and get their buy-in at that very, very early stage. Or will you build the initial, you know, prototype or the baseline and then move toward it? At what time is the right time? Yeah, it's, it's a, I would imagine, you know, every situation is a little bit different, but for me, um, I do think there is a feels important kind of a critical step. Like I, you know, if someone is truly joining you when you're in the idea phase and they're, you know, it's not really well formed, it's not really very far along. I mean, you're, you're kind of on that edge of like, maybe they should be a partner or a co-founder which has a much bigger expectation associated with it. You know, instead of me giving you some stock options in my business, I might feel like I need to give you 5% of it or 10% of it because it's just an idea and it's not worth anything. So I normally try to get a little further along. Um, so there is a real business we have incorporated. We've set a structure in place. We're working on MVP. I think it's something that I'm really going to pursue and at that point, it's like, okay, who are these people that I can surround myself with that could really help? That's not always the case. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm working on some, an idea right now that I've, you know, I've pulled a few people into it and said, if I do it, I'd love to have you involved. So I've kind of planted the seed. Um, but normally I'm trying to at least make a little bit of progress before I'm asking them to join a board of advisors. Yeah, got it. Um, super helpful stuff for sort of where we sit today. So thank you for, yeah. you know, here's a thank you for the, for the insights and the advice. I know you do have a, a football game to watch and we do also in Australia call this football. So uh, sorry, uh, America. <laughs> um, but um, but um, before I do let you go, Mac, um, I'd love to uh, firstly understand i mean it's not like you're a guy who's looking for a whole lot you're super busy and you got lots going on but for anyone that might want to get involved in whether it's exit dna or anything else that you're you're working on um what would be the best way for them to find out more to get in touch um yeah yeah no thank you so i, I have two sites you know i have a, a personal site which is um, maclackey.com and that's basically, you know, a little bit of my background. I blog here and there, post stuff that I think will be helpful. Um, so, you know, it'll, it's all free stuff, right? Just like this board of advisor thing. I've, I've put up several blog posts and links to um, various resources, things like that. And then I have an exitdna.com site, which talks a little bit more about that program. There's an application, you know, some, uh, some information. So if people are interested, you know, both of those are good resources. Um, my social channels all are basically, you know, my, the spelling is M-A-C, so Mac, Lackey, L-A-C-K-E-Y. So on all the social channels, I, you know, I post videos and try to be helpful. So any of those are, are fine places to reach me. If someone's really interested in exit DNA, as you know, I, I really kind of handpick a small group, typically cohorts of eight to 10 founders that I work with at a time. And so there's an application process or people can email me at exit at maclackey.com. And, you know, we can talk about the specific situation. I love to help people. I love to work with them. So I'm not trying to stiff arm people away, but I am trying to, you know, work with people that I think I can truly help. And I want them to get kind of off the charts ROI. So I have to make sure there's good alignment. And, and that makes a whole lot of sense. And, you know, you've got to protect the integrity of what you're looking to create and you know it's always got to be win-win so you know i'm sure people can appreciate that mac i can really i can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day uh and sitting down with me it's been super illuminating um to get to spend two and a half hours with you today has been uh, amazing so i'm super excited for next week's session um already doing the homework and yeah just want to say thanks again and um if if you're ever up for a second session mate i would always love to have you no happy to do it well, I, I very much appreciate you uh having me on your your show and asking great questions and if i can help you or any of your listeners i would be delighted to do so and i will look forward to our next session well thank you very much mac